Think about this. Sometimes life's journey moves along just the way you hoped it would, right? I mean, you study hard, you get good grades, you become the valedictorian of your graduating class which opens the door for you to follow your calling and land your dream job. Life is just like you dreamed it. Just like you dreamed it would be. And then, almost always, something happens that changes everything. It changes everything. Sometimes, Life is hard, but always God is good. The story I was talking about is actually the story of Eliza Hewitt, um, uh, the writer of the hymn that we're going to focus on today, the song we're focusing on uh, at the end of our, our time together today. And as a matter of fact, Eliza Hewitt uh, may have wondered if God can actually cause something good to come out of something that's so bad. Let me tell you a little bit about Eliza because it's going to be an important part of of the the song we sing as we understand the words of the song. Eliza was born on June the 28th of uh, 1851 in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and she grew up actually during the Civil War. Uh, She was educated in the local uh, public school system where she graduated as a valedictorian. Now listen to this school title name. She graduated as a valedictorian of the school's normal school Girls Normal School. That's the name of the school. Now, would we ever name a school that today? We would name it Girls Excellent or Girls School of Excellency, right? Or, or whatever. But the girl, Girls Normal School. And that's where she attended. She was a valedictorian. She became a teacher. What she always wanted to do, she wanted to work with children in the public schools there in, in Philadelphia. But then came that moment that that changed everything, when her career screeched to a halt, where she was forced to bed from a a a, a painful uh, spinal problem. She had this debilitating condition that was caused, actually, by there was a rebellious student that she was trying to correct in the classroom, and this student took a piece of heavy slate that they would use chalk on to write on if they didn't paper and pencil. He took this piece of heavy slate and hit her in the back with this piece of heavy slate, broke her back. She was in a body cast for six months, lying in bed. Changed her whole life. Just like that. Now, lying in bed for all this time, she could become bitter, right? I mean, she's at, Eliza's at a crossroads. She could be a victim, someone who life has dealt this bad hand and you just have to play it. Or she could be a survivor, someone who kept her faith and worked to overcome the the obstacles that she had been dealt. Thankfully, Eliza chose to be a survivor. Actually, when she was confined to bed, she said that she felt God's presence every single day. Think about that. Every single day she was there, she felt God's presence. And God used this time to prepare her and work on her. And and, and she started writing poetry and these poetry, she started uh, singing them. Some of them became hymns. And and, um, so as Eliza recovered some of her strength in later years, she was able to get around slowly. uh, But she uh, dealt with regular pain and and the lack of mobility for the rest of her life because of this, uh, this incident. But she didn't let it stop her from following her calling and serving the God that she loves. Despite her health problems, she was deeply interested. She couldn't teach in school, the public schools anymore, but she was very interested in in, uh, Sunday school. And so she became a part, she led the Sunday school program for the, uh, listen to this, another title, okay? Northern Home for Friendless Children. Huh? Northern Home for Friendless Children. Today, we would name it um, the Northern Home for Children with Endless Possibilities, right? A little more positive. But that was the name of it. And so actually then she worked on that for a while, and then she actually went to the, um, the, the Calvin Presbyterian Church there in Philadelphia, and at one point in her class alone, just in her class in Sunday school, 
she had over 200 students that would come on a regular basis to her Sunday school class. But while she was incapacitated before that time, she studied English literature and began to sing and write words like these. Words like this. She said, sing about the wondrous love of Jesus. Sing about His mercy and His grace. In the mansions bright and blessed, He'll prepare for us a place. Now, I'm not sure that sounds like a person who's been dealt the hand that, that causes her to lose her dream and, and her health all in one fell swoop. But it is. It's something that she did because she chose to focus on the things to come instead of the things of the past. And she was a godly survivor, is what I would call her. And during this time, there was a friend of Eliza's. Her name was Emily Wilson. She was married to a local Methodist pastor, Emily was, and and uh, she partnered in music with Eliza, and, and she was very accomplished uh, accompanist, and she played a lot of Eliza's hymns and some of the other things at the local camp meetings that they would attend together. And, and Emily wrote the music to the song that we'll be singing together here in just a few minutes. But uh, anyway, this, uh, this uh, Emily uh, was known, she, I, I guess she was quite an inspiration to her husband and the churches that he served the small congregations that she would come in. She was an amazing a musician and the contribution she gave to the local church was, was wonderful. She also did dramatic art, so that was a great thing in those churches. But anyway, she's credited with writing the music for the hymn When We All Get to Heaven that we're going to sing in a few minutes. But we remember Emily Hewitt, or rather Eliza Hewitt, excuse me, today because of the hymn she wrote after this incident that shattered the dreams of her future. Think about that. She's not, she's not memorialized. She's not remembered because of her living her dream. She's remembered for what happened after her dreams were shattered. Some of her hymns are when we all get to heaven. Heaven, uh, maybe if you're as old as I am, you remember some of these. Uh, There's sunshine in my soul today. Uh, will there be any stars in my crown? I was talking to a couple after the first service, and they just watched a movie called... Uh, uh, Stars in My Crown, a Western, where this was a preacher's favorite song back in the Western days. Uh, more About Jesus, Would I Know. Maybe you know that song, More, More About Jesus. Anyway, she wrote a lot of these hymns, and, and uh, she wrote several that, that are included in our, our hymnals. And, but this was a time of, of uh, what they called the Union re Revivalization, um, or Revivalism, excuse me. So this is post-Civil post, um, War, the, the, the country has been so divided, so split, and then the, during the Civil War, then as it comes back together, we pull the Union back together. The church was looking for, to, to help do that. And, and so there was this post-Civil War, they called it post-Civil War uh, Wesleyan preaching and Wesleyan worship. And uh, so, so there, this was a time that the Methodists and the Baptists, it was their time to shine. I mean, these denominations had exorbitant growth as revivals and camp meetings started breaking out and it kind of moved like the people did, kept continuing out west. And that was a, a major reason for the growth in the, the Methodist and the Baptist denominations was during this time. This was our biggest growth period was in the late 1800s. So, so several of us grew up singing these revivalist songs during, uh, sometimes it'd be a Sunday school thing, the gathering, sometimes it'd be a Sunday evening services, we would sing these kind of songs. Or maybe some of you ever, maybe if you remember revivals when you would go when they would have revivals during the night time at church during the week and, and do that. So some of those, so some of these songs that, that song you will, some of you will know them, the hymns, uh, When the Roll is Called Up Yonder, I'll Be There. Uh, that was one of those revivalist songs. Um, another one was Shall We Gather at the River, the beautiful, the beautiful river. Uh, uh, anyways, just some of those songs. But th those were, these were the, this was the time period, this, these were the type of songs that were being written. Now, now make no mistake that the, 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 the hymns addressing heaven, these were all, a lot of these hymns talked about heaven, and there were hymns before this time that addressed heaven or where we were going for eternity. Uh, a lot of the 18th century hymns by Charles Wesley and others referenced heaven as our ultimate destination. But in the 19th century, when they were writing, uh, there was added this spiritual fervor. So, so let me kind of do a side for a minute. I mean, so, so in the 2,000 years of Christianity, 
singing hymns and people con- being a part of the worship and, and singing is very is, is considerably new thing. This has started happen just when Charles Wesley would take some of his theological phrases and he would put them to one of the tunes that they, everybody knew because they sang them. When the, on, the, on the off chance they got to go eat, they would, be at, they would eat out at these what they called pubs or public houses. And they would go and there would be these tunes that everybody knew and they would sing these folk songs. Charles Wesley would take these tunes to these folk songs and he would, he would write down these theological treatises and then they would sing these. And this was the beginning of singing hymns in church, the beginning of hymns. And so then the second generation of hymns, uh, we often call them gospel songs instead of hymns because in these gospel songs in the 19th century when, when Eliza was writing, they would take these verses that would be written, say like Amazing Grace at one time had like 20 verses or 18 or something. So you would take these verses and you would put this refrain or a chorus in the middle of those like a lot of our songs have now. And you would put this chorus in there. And so you would take this song and you would, you would sing this verse and then you would put the refrain in, which would then allow you to build. Now, now I've mentioned before that I was raised a church musician, so I don't know the words to any hymns. I just know how to play them. But I know the courses to the hymns because they were repeated so many times. You know, like this song, When We All Get to Heaven, there's a, there's a course. And after every one of the four verses, you sing the chorus. And so you sing it four times. You get a chance where you kind of know that part. You don't have to look at the book or the words on the wall. And so you can just kind of sing them out and it builds the energy, builds the excitement. And so what happened was this original hymn singing that started in the 17th century, or 18th century, excuse me, then in the 19th century, then they built on that and started building the excitement with that. And, and all this, the feelings of, of, uh, of, of excitement and, and all this was going on, it was, a, it was a great time. There's this musical vitality, this spiritual fervor that was happening with this uh, revivals and the camp meetings. And so that's the, the setting in which um, Eliza was writing and wrote, wrote this hymn that we'll sing today. So, so the Baptists and the Methodists were, were the dominant sources of, of these songs. And, and Eliza, though she was, went to Presbyterian Church, uh, she, she went to the Methodist uh, campgrounds and attended Methodist uh, meetings, camp meetings at uh, the Ocean Grove uh, campgrounds. And so she would go out there uh, every year and go to the camp meetings and, and she would take her hymns out and they would sing her hymns and her and Emily would, would do that together. And, and uh, so that was, became a part of, of her, her life as well. So the hymn is when we all get to heaven. And I want to take the rest of my time this morning to uh, just kind of look at the, uh, at, at the verses because the verses, she did a great job theologically of pulling together the ideas of, of the journey that we're on. And because the journey is such an important part, thinking about that, such an important part of what we do as a church, as, as East Cross, I thought it was a great thing for us to do this morning. So actually, verse 1 says this, Seeing the wondrous love of Jesus, seeing His mercy and His grace, in the mansions bright and blessed, He'll prepare for us a place. He talks about mercy and grace, which always takes me back to, the, to, to Paul's writing to the church at Ephesus. I, I love the passage where Paul says this. This is Ephesians 2, verses 4 and 5. However, he says, God is rich in mercy. God is rich in mercy. Now, now what is mercy? Mercy is, is compassion or forgiveness that's shown towards somebody that you could cause harm to. You have the authority to cause harm to or punish. And to not do that, but yet to show them forgiveness. So God is rich in mercy. God can do what He wants with us. We're the created beings, yet God shows us mercy. He brought us to life with Christ while we were dead as a result of those things that we did wrong. He did this because of the great love that He has for us. And then He concludes this this phrase with this. You are saved by God's grace. Now, grace is unmerited favor, uh, which, which is also mentioned in this passage and in this verse. And so she's pulling the first part of this, of this uh, of verse out of this, this passage. And, and, and it's just a reminder that our journey with Christ begins with God's offering us mercy and grace. 
so we can be in relationship with Him. Even before we even knew we wanted to be in relationship with Him, God is there for us. Now, John Wesley called this what kind of grace? What was it? You remember? Awesome. Prevenient grace. All right? Prevenient grace. When God comes to us before, we even know we need grace. God is there and He comes to us. So prevenient grace is what He called it. And that's what this is talking about, this mercy and the grace that God comes to us. And then there's this phrase that, that she uses. It says, In that mansion, bright and blessed, He'll prepare for us a place. But when you go back to the King James Version, which they would have used in her time of writing uh, the, the Bible, uh, when, they're, when they're writing the hymns in the Bible, it says this in John chapter 14, verse 2. It says, In my Father's house are many mansions. Now today we use the term rooms or, or places. But in the King James... They, it was it said, that in my Father's house are many mansions. Must be a big house if you got mansions in your house, right? If it were not so, I would have told you. And then Jesus continues. This is Jesus' words. I go to prepare a place for you. And then the next verse continues. When I go to prepare a place for you, I will return and take you with me so that where I am, you will be too. Actually, these are great words for us when we're reminded of our mortality which can happen from time to time, right? And so, in that mansion, brought and blessed, He'll prepare for us a place. Now, the second verse of this song, I call it the journey verse, okay? It's the verse of journey. Um, uh, so we, we talk about journey every time we come together, meet together as East Cross here, and we, we talk about our journey that, that we're on. And so, this says this, the journey verse, what I call says this, while we walk the pilgrim pathway, clouds will overspread the sky. But when traveling days are over, not a shadow, not a sigh. Now, Eliza knew about cloudy days, right? When you think about what you go through in life. She knew about those days when nothing goes right. When you just have to keep the faith. When you're doing your best to serve in the public school system and you're doing your best to correct the unruly and they come back and hit you in the back and break your back and it changes your life forever. She knew about what it was on those days when nothing went right. Paul wrote uh, to the church at Corinthian, he said this, so we aren't depressed. But even if our bodies are breaking down on the outside, the person that we are on the inside is being renewed every day. Our temporary minor problems are producing an, an eternal stockpile of glory for us that is beyond all comparison. Can't you imagine Eliza thinking about this as she's uh, writing this hymn? As we walk the pilgrim pathway, clouds will overspread the sky, but when traveling days are over, not a shadow, not a sigh. Because in the process of the struggles and the problems that we have, it says we are, Paul says, we're producing an eternal stockpile of glory. Let's continue with verse 18. We don't focus on the things that can be seen, but on the things that can't be seen. The things that can be seen don't last, but the things that can't be seen are eternal. And then there's those mysterious words from, from Revelation 21. When the voice of the Lord speaks out in this apocalyptic writing, I heard a loud voice from the throne say, Look, God is dwelling, or God's dwelling is here with humankind. He will dwell with them and they will be His peoples. God Himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. There will be no mourning, crying, or pain anymore for the former things have passed away. So the second verse reminds us that in heaven, at the end of this journey, at, the, at the, this the goal that we're looking for, that light replaces those shadows. And, and what do shadows represent? Shadows are, are those things that the darkness, they represent the, the unknown, things that we can't see, that we can fear. There'll be none of those. And the sighs 
of sorrow and pain will be left behind because there will be no more sorrow or pain. See, when we're reminded of, of the future for us believers, we, the conclusion of our journey with Jesus first, I think when we think about it, we can get excited. We, I think even euphoric when we look at the prospect that lies ahead of us. Because the course of this song says when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. There's this heaven and then there's this physical presence of God always that we will have. But then as we move toward the third verse, Apostle Paul, I, he, he talks about bringing, or excuse me, Apostle Peter, he, he brings our feet back to the ground when he writes. I mean, he's very plain spoken and he reminds us that between that wonderful day of rejoicing when we get to heaven. And now, between those two, we join the Lord in suffering. And suffering. You could use different words and make us feel better, right? You could say living or something else. Or you could even say going on to perfection. I think John Wesley would have written that in there. But Peter says in suffering. This, this life each of us has with all of its imperfections is the journey that we travel with Jesus. So the journey with Jesus is not something that's separate from where we're at today. It's, this is a part of it. You know, this learning and this growing, the making mistakes, the failing, and then the winning, the crying and the laughing. It's all part of this journey that we take on our way with Christ. So let me read the words that Peter says. This is in 1 Peter, his first letter, chapter 4, verse 13. It says, Instead, rejoice as you share Christ's suffering. You share His suffering now so that you may have overwhelming joy when His glory is revealed. Eliza Hewitt penned the idea, these ideas in, in her third verse of the hymn. She said, let us then be true and faithful, trusting, serving every day, just one glimpse of Him in glory will the toils of life repay. So just keep on keeping on, as the saying goes, focusing on the beauty of the future of what this journey holds. Sometimes we have to do that because sometimes... We get hit in the back with heavy pieces of slate. Sometimes our life's dreams are shattered. Sometimes life doesn't go exactly the way we planned. And so sometimes the reality is that there's also some suffering. That's the theme of the third verse. But let's look on, let's go ahead and let's. Uh, uh, let's, let's continue on to the fourth verse. This is the last verse that she wrote. It says something about this beautiful future of our journey with Jesus Christ. It says this, Onward to the prize before us. Soon His beauty will behold. Soon the pearly gates will open. We shall tread the streets of gold. Now, there's a clear reference here back in, the, in Revelations 21. And you go down to the 21st verse. It's the very end of the Bible if you want to look it up. When it talks about and explains what heaven is like, the best, the best the writer can explain something that he has no comparison for. He says, the twelve gates are twelve pearls. Each one of the gates was made from a single pearl, and the city's main street was pure gold, as transparent as glass. It's a clear reference to that. Just one glimpse of, well, just a, that soon the pearly gates will open and we shall tread the streets of gold. That's a clear reference to that. But she also talks about the completion of our journey. She talks about finishing the race, receiving the prize. Paul uses this language of, of the winning the race in his letters. He says, and I'm just going to pass over that, that next verse, those next verses. And I'll go down to the Philippians verse. Let's go down to the 1 Corinthians verses, uh, if we could, Debbie, on that. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 24 and 25 says this, Don't you know that all the runners in the stadium run, but only one gets the prize? So run to win. Everyone who competes practices self-discipline in everything. The runners do this to get a crown of leaves 
which shrivel up and die, but we do it to receive a crown that never dies. And so our journey is something that we need to continue on. We need to keep moving on our journey. We need to keep moving along. We need to keep understanding that today is not the final day. Today is the best day of my life. Ah, I could end here, but that's not the end. Or maybe this is one of those days that you think, man, life just isn't what I hoped it would be. That's still not the end. This song is a great reminder that the end is being in the presence of God forever. The presence of the, the, the it's the beautiful place that 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 the writer of the Revelation tried to tell us about, but had trouble explaining it because he's never it had, had nothing to compare it with. And then after you sing these four verses, you start understanding about what our journey's about and what we can look forward to in this journey. Then there's this course that I talked about, this refrain that, that you add and, and you put together and you build it along with every one of the verses. And it says, when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout to victory. So we're going to sing the song. For some, how many of you know the, this hymn, the, When We All Get to Heaven? Okay, how many of you are not familiar with it? Okay, so, so it's kind of divided amongst younger and older people, right? Sorry, it is. I mean, this written in the 1800s, right? So this song, um, coming from this uh, uh, the Revivalist series, this Revivalist time, this is what it, it says, and, and it goes like this. Sing the, sing along with me. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus. Sing His mercy and His grace. In the mansion bright and blessed, He'll prepare for us a place. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, We'll sing and shout the victory. Isn't that nice? It could be sung in anything. It could be singing a hymnal. It could be done as a contemporary. Matter of fact, we listened to a contemporary version of this the other day. It was quite nice. Let's sing the second verse. This is the journey verse. Remember? This is our song. This is our verse. While we walk the pilgrim pathway, clouds will overspread the sky. But when traveling days are over, not a shadow, not a sigh. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. So let us then be true and faithful, trusting, serving every day. Just one glimpse of Him in glory will the toils of life repay. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, We'll sing and shout the victory. Now the last verse is one when we think about the end of our trip, the end of our journey that we're on. So I invite you to stand with me as we sing this one. Ready? And then when we get to the chorus, even if you don't know the song, you've sung it three times and you've heard me say it a couple of times. So everybody can sing the third, they can sing their chorus once together, right? Onward to the prize before us, soon His beauty will behold. Soon the pearly gates will open, we shall tread the streets of gold. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Let's sing it again. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, 
Jesus will sing and shout the victory. Isn't that a great idea? You can be seated for a minute because we're not quite through with church for the day. I was going to do some more songs. I decided I would do them all today and then we could just take next week off, okay? I, of, course I, of course, I'm joking about that, but I did want to... Um, I want us to think for just a moment, and we're going to do a, a we have a family that's going to join church today, we're going to do a baptism in a few moments, but before we get to that part, I want us to kind of stop for just a minute and consider the awesomeness of our future. I know as Methodists, we, we focus a whole lot on discipleship and we talk about what we should do and how we should do those things and how we should be better people and how we should reach people in our communities and man those things are so stinking important it's not even funny but from time to time we need to consider our future what's coming down the road what what's happening what's what's going on what's tomorrow going to look like well, the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Peter, the Apostle John, Eliza Hewitt understood that the future is, is awesome. It's beyond being able to even understand. This journey today may be a great day, and I hope, I hope, this, I hope 2019 and 2020 are the best years of your life. But sometimes they're not. For some of us, there's going to be some things, some bumps in the road. And on those days, I think Eliza would tell us, just hang on. Be faithful and true. And as we do that, then God is preparing this place that's beyond comprehension. So hang on. Because in our future is heaven. What a wonderful thing to have.